18 July 1989. So this is a video essay about the Andy Warhol film Lonesome Cowboys, but before we get to Lonesome Cowboys, I just want to tell you about the summer of 1989, because that was the year that I decided to watch every horror film in my local video store to find the scariest film ever made. It all began with me renting the movie Pulse one day, which a, a lot of people might like, but I rented Pulse, I watched it, and I was uh, very disappointed. It wasn't what I was looking for, it might be what you're looking for, but I was left wanting a little more. I wanted something genuinely terrifying, so my plan was go to the local video shop on Westbourne Grove in London, look at the horror shelves, rent every single film on the shelves, and by doing this, I would find the scariest film ever made. Also, this is monumental for me because prior to this year, horror films had kind of freaked me out and I really didn't want much to do with them. I used to go to a, another video shop on Edgeware Road, which was actually a kind of like a the TV rental shop, but at the back of it, they had uh, a few videos and there were a few there such as Bloody Birthday, Happy Birthday to Me and Scanners in particular. They had posters that just haunted my nightmares. They were just the worst thing imaginable. I wanted absolutely nothing to do with them. Also kind of fascinated with them and kept taking the boxes off the shelves and inspecting them. So 1989, renting every single horror film on the shelves. So I rented as many horror films as I could and the summer went on. Spoiler alert, I never found the scariest film ever made on those shelves because in 1989 the best horror movies were not available on shelves in video shops but perhaps that's a story for another time. One element of note though is that during this summer of watching horror films instead of keeping my eyes on the goal of finding the scariest film ever made I ended up getting terribly interested in budget and this question of what you can do with less and less money started to kind of spin around in my head and that ended up with me getting myself a copy of the 1968 Andy Warhol film Lonesome Cowboys. Um, for those who don't know, Lonesome Cowboys is a film about, it's about two people, uh, a man and a woman, the man played by Taylor Mead, the woman played by Viva, who are in this town when a bunch of cowboys turn up and cause chaos, kind of. I mean, if, if you need a story, that's what it's about. It's really not what it's about. Lonesome Cowboys is about destabilizing the, the kind of the Western mystique, injecting homosexuality into this story, and just a, a bunch of East Coast boys having fun in the West Coast, or Arizona, if you want. Um, as a fun kind of side note, the FBI investigated this film. You can go onto the internet and you can download the FBI reports, and they're all redacted. Yeah, what a world. Remember when the FBI used to investigate artists? Fun stuff. So, yes, I became terribly interested in budget. I put this film on, and I just, I think the first thought that came to my mind was, this is a film? I was spellbound. I'd never seen anything like it in my life. I think a lot of people probably have never seen anything like it in their life. The very first thing that you notice is probably this. What you're looking at here is an in-camera edit. Normally when a film is made, they turn the cameras on, somebody says action, people act, and then they cut, and then the film goes into what is called editing, when things are removed. There are alternate takes of a scene. You might have two or three or four takes of a scene before everyone gets it right. You might be Stanley Kubrick and you might do way more than two or three. What you're seeing in Lonesome Cowboys is that every single inch of film is being used. There, there's no splicing here whatsoever. They load a reel into the camera, they turn the camera on, they act, they stop, they then turn the camera straight back on again and carry on. There's no clapperboard, there's no cut call, there's no action call. People are just improvising. They're just making it up on the spot. They would have had a scenario given to them of like, do this kind of thing, but they wouldn't have been given specific lines to do. Never seen anything like it. And before continuing to talk about Lonesome Cowboys, we should talk a little bit about Andy Warhol. Andy Warhol was an American artist who became a filmmaker. His transition from art to film involved many, many steps. He started off by himself filming single word subjects like sleep, eat and so on. He was also a big collaborator. He worked with people both in front of and behind the camera, which is fairly well known. There are a number of collaborators, but there are three in particular that I want to talk about. That's Ronald Tavell, Chuck Wine, and Paul Morrissey, who worked on Lonesome Cowboys with Andy Warhol. Each one has a kind of a different thing. The films that they worked on with Warhol end up being slightly different for different reasons. Ronald Tavell is one of the earliest collaborators. He was a writer that Andy was introduced to at a party. Uh, Ronald Tavell went on to form 
perform the theatre of the ridiculous. His films with Warhol are more theatrical, they're, they're more kind of staged. People are playing characters who are not themselves. The scenarios are kind of otherworldly at times. Chuck Wine is quite different because he's coming to Warhol with this philosophy of real, real. The idea being that the real of film, which is in the camera, which is turning, is creating the reality that you're seeing on the screen. Chuck Wine's films are far more documents, perhaps. People in the film are playing variations of themselves. They often have the same name. They talk about real things which happen to them. The similarity between Ronald Tavell and Chuck Wine is that both of them would sit off camera and they would interact with the actors. They would give direction. They would tell people what to say. They would have lines on cards. And, and then you've got Paul Morrissey. Paul Morrissey was an experimental filmmaker before meeting Warhol. Ronald Tavell and Chuck Wine were not. Paul Morrissey knew a lot about filmmaking. He summarised his role with The Factory as he knew what Warhol wanted to achieve and helped him to do that. Paul Morrissey is perhaps the least obtrusive of the collaborators. He just kind of allows Warhol to continue doing the thing that Warhol wants to keep doing. He did, however, introduce a few things which were new. He introduced panning on the film My Hustler, something that Warhol was ambivalent about at first. Paul Morrissey also introduced the idea of scenes, camera setups, doing films which were not just one shot, one scene, but doing films which took place over different locations, filming scenes with a breakdown of camera setups. So filming from this angle, filming from this angle, filming from this angle. Pretty straightforward stuff, but new to Warhol at the time. Morrissey's influence also is kind of somewhere between Ronald Tavell and Chuck Wine in that we're playing characters. These are not documents, this is not documentary, these are people playing characters in a scenario which is not their life, but it's very similar to their life. It's like one step to the left, if you like. Another thing to mention about Lonesome Cowboys is that although I'd heard of Andy Warhol before, I'd never heard of Taylor Mead. Although I came to Lonesome Cowboys with pre-existing knowledge of Joe D'Alessandro, and the, the films which Paul Morrissey shot with Joe D'Alessandro had never heard of Taylor Mead before, obviously now I have, but Taylor Mead was a real revelation. He was so much fun. Every single scene that he has in Lonesome Cowboys is just pure life. It's pure energy, an absolute delight to watch. As a kind of a fun aside, in 1999, in September, I had the privilege of looking after Taylor Mead for the day. He was shooting on a film. I was asked to kind of look after him, so I spent the day hanging around and chatting with him, and for me to go from showing all of my friends Lonesome Cowboys and introducing them to Taylor Mead and introducing them to the delight and fun that this kind of anti-cinema film could be. For me to then spend the day sitting in Uptown New York with Taylor Mead, chatting to him, hearing all about his life. Unbelievable. Just wonderful. I was exceptionally camera shy, so I, well, I still am exceptionally camera shy. No photos were taken of this, so you're just going to have to believe me that it happened. Kind of critical here is that in 1968, Warhol was shot by Valerie Solanas, the writer of the Scum Manifesto, the Society for Cutting Up Men, post being shot, Warhol kind of started closing his life down a bit. He didn't really want all the crazy people around him that he'd been letting in. Paul Morrissey ends up becoming the, the filmmaking arm of the Warhol company. Lonesome Cowboys was shot in February 1968. Warhol was shot in June, July, something like that. After Lonesome Cowboys, Morrissey went on to make the, the Trash Heat Flesh trilogy, which is super well known. The style of those films is very similar to what you see in Lonesome Cowboys, but Lonesome Cowboys is directed by Andy Warhol. The camera in Lonesome Cowboys is entirely operated by Andy Warhol. Paul Morrissey's duties on Lonesome Cowboys were, he was an executive producer again, but I think he did the sound as well, which might be why you can actually hear all the dialogue in this film. You always got some rattlesnakes, nothing exists without some rattlesnakes. I like to have a beer. So that's the kind of background to learn from Cowboys. Before I talk a little bit more about it, I need to just take a sidestep and start talking about Giallo for a moment because that's that's relevant here. So Giallo is an Italian exploitation cinema movement. It started in the 1960s, very heavily influenced by German murder mystery thrillers, which were created, I think, in the in the 50s, late 50s, early 60s. Key to the creation of Giallo is Mario Bava's 1963 film Black Sabbath, a portmanteau horror film series short stories. One of those short stories was The Telephone, starring Michelle Mercier. It's worth seeking out both the Italian and the American versions of Black Sabbath because they feature two different edits of the film. They're both interesting. Obviously, the Italian one is probably best, but they're both interesting. You should um, check them out if you like this kind of thing, if you like looking at what one country does different to another country. So Telephone kind of set the scene for it. We've got women in peril. We've got great makeup, great wardrobe, great production design. You've got that kind of Italian kind of colourfulness and grandiosity 
these are kind of the key elements of giallo. So if you were going to break giallo down into a series of words, you would probably say women, women in peril, phones or analog tech in general, costumes and wardrobe and makeup, production design, location, endless threat. There's a kind of a hum of violence happening throughout a giallo. You've got that Italian joie de vivre as well, that kind of lust for life. At the same time, there's a kind of aggressive violence going on underneath. So giallo films raise a kind of interesting question, which is, are they exploitation films? Yes, they are, undoubtedly. However, they also give incredible central roles to actresses who are not getting such kind of nuanced, complicated roles in other genres. They're often made to do things which you might not want to do as an actor. At the same time, you're playing a character who is much more kind of interesting than the other characters you'd be playing at the same time in Italy. So are Giallo films exploitation? Yes, but let's break down the term to exploit because when we talk about exploiting something we've got two different meanings one of them is to use something to your own advantage or to gain an advantage you exploit someone by taking advantage of them getting them to do things that they might not want to do for your own personal gain are the people in giallo films being exploited Yes, absolutely. But then you've got the other meaning of the word exploit. Use something fully to gain as much as you can from something, to use something up completely. So are the actresses and giallo films being exploited? Are we getting as much as possible out of them? Yes, we are. Let's go back to Andy Warhol. Learn some cowboys, we have Eric Emerson. Eric Emerson is a dancer. So if you have a dancer in your film, what do you do? You use the fact that he has abilities other people don't have. In this scene here with Eric Emerson and Joe D'Alessandro, Eric goes through a series of moves designed to develop your butt so that your gun hangs a bit better but he's he's just doing dance moves is eric emerson being exploited here by andy warhol eh, probably is andy warhol exploiting eric emerson meaning to get as much as possible from him yes he is isn't that what you want from filmmaking don't you want to get the most out of your location the most out of your cast the most out of your script that's the goal for filmmaking anyone who is unaware of the exploitative role that a director has with everyone around them is a little bit misguided or a little bit naive because the principal job of a director is to get the most out of everybody that you're working with. As a director you are not a cinematographer, you're not an actor, you're not a composer, you're not in anything but you have to encourage these people to give 110%. You want everyone to be the best that they could possibly be and that's a good goal. Occasionally you have to do this by getting people to do things that they might otherwise not want to do and that doesn't feel good. It's not a good feeling but it's there and Lonesome Cowboy kind of introduces this complicated relationship of exploitation that directors have, that all directors have. This is a difficult topic, there are no easy answers here. Is Andy Warhol exploiting his cast and crew? Yes he is. Is he exploiting them meaning to get the best out of them as possible? Yes he is. Is this whole topic a little bit more complicated than can be summarised in a YouTube video? Yes it is. These are big ideas but I just want to introduce the idea that this is what watching this film brought to me. A kind of labyrinth opened up in my head, a pathways that lead in every single possible direction. A little bit more about Lonesome Cowboys. So watching Lonesome Cowboys I just thought this is a film and then I thought if this is a film I could do this. Anyone could do this. Look at this. They also introduce the idea that filmmaking could be fun. It could be something that you could do with your friends. You could go somewhere, go to a place and have fun while you were doing it. Lonesome Cowboys was made for three thousand dollars. It made way more than that in its first two weeks. My interest in budgets, what can you achieve on a low budget? Well you can do this. It kind of introduced a behind the curtain peek at filmmaking that hadn't existed for me until I found that film. The idea of doing in-camera edits was something that I didn't know about. The idea of just taking your friend somewhere and having fun and making a film, that, that was something that wasn't in my head. I always thought that filmmaking was a kind of a structured, laborious, expensive process. But Lonesome Cowboys taught me it could be something different. Filmmaking can be fresh throw all of the rules out the window. I'm not saying that you should go out, rent a copy of Lonesome Cowboys and watch it right now because I think most people would find it interminable. But all I want to talk about is the fact that Lonesome Cowboys existed as a little window into something else for me. I'm eternally grateful to it because prior to that I had a completely different picture of cinema in my head and what Lonesome Cowboys was, it was kind of a gateway drug really. Once you've sat down and watched the entirety of Lonesome Cowboys and once you've made all of your friends watch Lonesome Cowboys over and over and over again. You start looking for other things. You go out there and you find other films. Following Lonesome Cowboys, I went down my own path, found lots of different films which are kind of influenced by what can you do for less? Can cinema be something different from what we expect cinema to be? And I went to particular places. If you were to watch your version of Lonesome Cowboys and then go off on your own particular journey, it would be completely distinct. It would be completely different from mine, but it would be valid. It would be fascinating. And what you found on that journey would 
enrich you it would grow you and i would encourage you to go out and find your own lonesome cowboy so what did i learn from lonesome cowboys i learned that lonesome cowboys is for me it's my gateway drug into other forms of if you like anti-cinema or an interest in anti-cinema but where's yours what's yours go find it get out there it's out there right now it's just that you don't know about it hello people people there are no people Oh, well.